Well, our reading today is from Genesis chapter 15, the whole chapter. You'll find it there on the screen or if you've printed off the service outlines or in your own Bibles at home. Genesis chapter 15. After these events, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward will be very great. But Abram said, Lord God, what can you give me since I'm childless and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? Abram continued, look, you've given me no offspring, so a slave born in my house will be my heir. Now the word of the Lord came to him, this one will not be your heir. Instead, one who comes from your own body will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look at the sky and count the stars if you're able to count them. And then he said to him, your offspring will be that numerous. Abram believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. He also said to him, I am the Lord who brought you from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, Lord God, how can I know that I'll possess it? He said to him, bring me a three-year-old cow, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove and a young pigeon. So he brought all these to him, split them down the middle and laid the pieces opposite each other, but he did not cut up the birds. Birds of prey came down on the carcasses, but Abram drove them away. As the sun was setting, a deep sleep fell on Abram and suddenly a terror and great darkness descended on him. Then the Lord said to Abram, Know this for certain, your offspring will be strangers in a land that does not belong to them. They'll be enslaved and oppressed 400 years. However, I will judge the nation they serve, and afterwards they'll go out with many possessions. But you'll go to your fathers in peace and be buried at a ripe old age. In the fourth generation, they'll return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. When the sun had set and it was dark, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch appeared and passed between the divided animals. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, I give this land to your offspring, from the brook of Egypt to the Euphrates River, the land of the Canaanites, Kenizzites, Cadmonites, Hittites, Perizzites, Rephaim, Amorites, Canaanites, Girgashites, and Jebusites. This is the word of the Lord. We're going to spend a bit of time looking at this now and you'll find a sermon outline there uh, on the screen or if you've printed it off, uh, an opportunity for you to write notes. Uh, There's a comments box at the bottom of the page. You know the drill. We've been doing this for a few weeks now. Uh, Please send any comments, questions or feedback to Neil or myself. Well, how does God deal with humans? Uh, It's a question that everyone, whether they're aware of it or not, asks at some point in their lives, everyone's got an opinion. Uh, To some, God doesn't exist, so he doesn't deal with humans. Uh, To others, God is a figment of our imagination, so we deal with God in the way we want. To many, God's a neglectful dictator. He made the world, he can fix the world, he runs the world, he just can't be bothered. Others see God as a convenient whipping boy. We deal with him, we complain to him, but we ignore him when things are going well. And some see God as a great big lawgiver. So he gives us this huge list of things to do. And the purpose of our life, the way we deal with him, is just tick them off every day as well as we can. And we hope that the scales balance out in the end. So how does God deal with humans? Uh, it's an important question because at its heart it deals with the guts of Christianity. I mean, that's the message of Christianity, isn't it? God wants to deal with you. God wants to relate to you, and this is how he does it. Abram's discussions with God in Genesis 15 reveal how God deals with humans. Let me pray, and then we're going to dive into it together. Dear God, thanks for your word. Thanks for this, oh, it seems obscure, interaction between this man Abram and God in the Middle East so many thousands of years ago. But thank you for this for the way in which it reveals the consistency, the constancy, the faithfulness with which you do with people in a way that never changes, is always the same and wonderfully is for our benefit at your work. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm at point two on the outline. Uh, The world's broken. Uh, It's broken by human sin. Uh, I'm talking about not only today, but back there in the time of Abram. 
uh, the desire and action that says, I'm God and God's not, has broken the world and God's judged this sin. The right penalty for rejecting the author of life is death. If you don't want God, God says, not a problem. You don't have to have me, but you can have what's left, which is death. But God's not neglected his creation. God's not neglected his image bearers. He loves them too much. And so his plan remains the same. His people living with him in his place under the blessing of his rule through his word. That's the way it's always been and that's always been God's plan. And so God chooses Abram as a man through which to restore this design to the world. Remember in Genesis 12, he makes three promises to Abram. Abram will have a large family that will become a great nation. They'll have a land and through this family, God will bring blessing to the world. He'll reverse the curse of brokenness, of sin. Abram obeys God, but there are some significant obstacles to these promises that God has given him. Abram's wife, Sarah, is barren. The land that God has promised is occupied. Abram's nephew, Lot, is pesky. And there is the truth of Abram's sinful human nature. Now, after Abram's demonstrated his reliance upon God uh, yet again, God will give this land to Abram. Abram will not seize it by his own strength. All of these problems rear their ugly head again at the start of Genesis 15. Look at verse 1. After these events, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward will be very great. But Abram said, Lord God, what can you give me since I'm childless and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus? Abram continued, look, you've given me no offspring, so a slave born in my house will be my heir. Now the word of the Lord came to him. This one will not be your heir. Instead, one who comes from your own body will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look at the sky, count the stars if you're able to count them. And then he said to him, your offspring will be that numerous. Abram believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. After these events, well, we're told exactly when these two conversations take place, some time after Abram had shown that he's the strongest man going around in the land of Canaan. Uh, the structure of this passage is really striking. Twice God speaks to Abram. Twice Abram responds with a question about God's promises. Twice God demonstrates his faithfulness by reassuring Abram. Now, face value, Abram's biggest problem at the moment is that he's got a target on his back. That happens when you demonstrate that you're the strongest bloke in the sandpit. Abram's just walloped the local colonial powers, freed his own nephew, Restore the possessions of the king of Sodom. Everyone's going to be gunning for this man, even more so because he's a foreigner without the security of land or home. So in verse 1, God reassures him of his security. Don't be afraid, Abram. I'm your sure. Your reward will be very great. God speaks to Abram and that's enough. God's word reveals God himself. God's word reassures. God states very clearly that he will protect Abram and that under God there's nothing to fear. Well, we expect God to say this, don't we? After all, God's the reason Abram's there. God's the one who's just manifestly enabled Abram to beat up these local kings and rescue his nephew. Of course God's going to say that. But Abram's got a question. Look there in verses 2 and 3. But Abram said, Lord God, what can you give me? Since I'm childless and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. Abram continued, Look, you've given me no offspring, so a slave born in my house will be my heir. I, I don't think it's a rude question. I don't think Abram's having a whinge at this point. I don't think he's being doubtful. I, I think he just wants to deal straight with God. He's just publicly committed himself to trusting God and now he wants to be open and honest. And the real issue is the issue of security. That's the issue of children. Abram will only survive as a name in this land if he has kids. In all truth, this lies at the heart of the very promises of God that brought Abram to the land he now stands in. God, if you are my protector, what about children? Where are they? God, if I am going to be a great nation, 
How is this even possible? And God answers immediately. Look there in verse 4. Now the word of the Lord came to him. This one will not be your heir. Instead, one who comes from your own body will be your heir. And he took him outside and said, look at the sky. Count the stars if you are able to count them. And then he said to him, your offspring will be that numerous. God's response is a promise. I don't need to tell you how impressive that image is. We know what stars look like out here, don't we? How vast that expanse is. But this is God's promised word to Abram. Like the stars, so will your descendants be. And it will start with a child from your own body. Abram's response in verse 6 is crucial. Abram believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. Here's the first part of how God relates to humans. God does so on the basis of faith, trust. Let me say that again. God relates to humans on the basis of faith, trust. In general, our world loves this idea. Wherever you go on Facebook, people are living by faith as they make decisions, as they face hardship, as they deal with dilemmas and challenges. The universal response I get is, you just got to have faith. That's a lovely statement, isn't it? But let me tell you, like that, it's utterly meaningless. The importance is in the detail. And we need to notice the detail here in verse 6. Abram has faith in someone. The object of Abram's faith here is crucial. It's in God. It's not just an airy, fairy thing that seems to float out there that you've got to have. Faith works this way. It's implicit in the word. To be anything other than a waffly, meaningless truth, faith has to have a direction, be in something or someone. Otherwise, it's nonsensical. Abram's faith in God is because of what God has revealed in his words. That is crucial. Abram trusts what God promises because he knows that God delivers on what he speaks on his words. In this sense, Abram doesn't have faith in things unknown or unheard of. There's nothing blind about this faith. Abram's listened. Abram's seen. Abram has watched God do exactly as he says, and so he trusts. Abram's trust in God and his promise leads God to a declaration, to declare something about Abram, that Abram is righteous. Put simply, God and Abram are relating as they should. That's crucial because here we see the guts of how humans and God deal with each other. On the one hand, Abram can do nothing about the significant obstacles in his life to the promises of God. He can't undo the barrenness of his wife. He himself can't remove all these inhabitants of the land. He can't remove Lot as his own nephew, even change his own human nature that wavers and wanders. He's completely reliant upon God. On the other hand, God promises to deal with all of those issues As he speaks, humans are completely dependent upon God so that they can relate rightly to him. Let me say that again. Humans are completely dependent upon God so that they can relate rightly to him. This then is the guts of the relationship between humans and God. God does it all. And humans trust him, being dependent upon him, taking him at his word and living like it. Abram's declared to be relating rightly with God purely on this basis because he trusts him, believes him. It's not an action. It's not a good deed. It's just a state of relationship. Abram trusts God. And God declares that he is dealing rightly, relating rightly with him. God then speaks again. I'm at point four on the outline. This time he refers not to security, but to the land, the other key physical part of the promise to Abram. Look there in verse seven. 
He also said to him, I am the Lord who brought you from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. Again, God states very clearly his promise to Abram, this land will be yours. And yet again, Abram asks the question, we know he will, how will I know that this will take place? And then what follows is a very significant ceremony. Verses 9 through 12. Now, there are many things that have puzzled commentators here and readers across the years. Why these animals? Why their age? Why this cutting? Why some cut? Why others not cut? Why this setup? Now, let me be very clear. I've got no very clear answers. Not this morning, but I want to make two observations. First, it's a significant moment because whatever else is taking place, This involves the death of very significant assets. Second, the moment is terrible, even terrifying, in the sense that meeting God is terrifying. Verse 12, as the sun was setting, a deep sleep fell on Abram and suddenly a terror and great darkness descended on him. Abram has just been declared right with God and yet he is still terrified in the presence of God. And then God speaks. Look at verse 13. The Lord said to Abram, Know this for certain. Your offspring will be strangers in a land that does not belong to them. They will be enslaved and oppressed 400 years. However, I will judge the nation they serve, and afterwards they'll go out with many possessions. But you'll go to your fathers in peace and be buried at a ripe old age. In the fourth generation, they will return here for the iniquity of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. They're remarkable words. For one of the original readers of this text, these words are a summary of the next five books of the Bible. How did God know? Well, because God had planned. God supervised. God has power over all these events. Abram's family will possess the land, and that means Abram will, even though he dies at a ripe old age. God promises this to be the case. It will happen in his time. The ceremony is all about God committing himself to the fulfillment of his promise for the benefit of Abram. At a certain point in time, which God has already decided, Abram's descendants will possess the land. And if you know your Bible, this actually happens as God says. In 400 years' time, Abram's family does come to this land after being rescued from slavery in a land not their own. And they do take it. The ceremony is not complete, though, is it? God then uses an image to finish the ceremony. Verse 17. When the sun had set and it was dark, a smoking firepot and a flaming torch appeared and passed between the divided animals. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, I'll give this land to your offspring from the brooks of Egypt to the Euphrates River the land of the Kenites, Kenizzites, Cadmonites, Hittites, Perizzites, Rephaim, Amorites, Canaanites, Girgashites, and Jebusites. Here is God's accompaniment to faith. He cuts a covenant with Abram. Now, a covenant is an agreement between two or more people. And the language here is very explicitly that. Whenever you make that agreement, God cuts it. Something dies to show the significance of this moment. And God's movement between those carcasses in that light is almost as if he's saying, what happened to them will happen to me if I do not keep my promise. Now that covenant is between two or more people, a binding agreement with obligations on both sides. And yet if you look closely at verses 17 to 21, you'll notice that there's only one party committing here, only one party that's obligated. One party doing all the heavy lifting, all the work, and that party is, that's right, it's God, the Lord. All Abram need do is accept and trust what God has committed to doing. So here is the accompaniment to faith, God's binding commitment to his promise to deal with the world through Abram's family, to do it for Abram's family, and for the whole world. Now, in many ways, what we've just looked at seems a little removed from our question. I'm at point five on the outline. How does God deal with humans? After all, Abram was thousands of years ago. 
Abram's unique, living in a very different world, or why would God do the same things now? It's interesting, isn't it, that when the Apostle Paul writes about God dealing with humans in Romans chapters 3 and 4, to the largest known city in the largest known empire of the whole world, when Paul writes about that, where does he go for his evidence to answer that question? Well, he goes to Genesis 15, doesn't he? To show that this is how God has always dealt with people, even more so now. If you look closely at what Paul writes in Romans chapters 3 to 4, you'll realise that God is still dealing with people in exactly the same way, freely committing himself to their benefit, doing it all himself, and all they need do is take him at his word, trust him. And the problem remains the same, doesn't it? All people are sinful. All people are living as if they are God and God's not. Romans chapter 3, verse 23. Humans face that insurmountable problem. They cannot do it with sin themselves. Sounds a little bit like Abram. And so God brings his plan begun all the way back there in Abram to completion. He sends the great descendant of Abram, God's own son, Jesus Christ, to live, die and rise for humans. God freely does this so that the judgment for humans is dealt with by his own son, Romans 3.24. God's work is available to anyone who takes God at his word, who trusts that God has dealt with their sin by turning his judgment on Jesus for them. Romans 3.23. If humans take God at his word, God declares that they're right with him. They relate to him through trusting what he's done for them in Jesus, fulfilling his promise. Romans 3.24. You see, when you unpack it, God relates now through Jesus in exactly the same way he's always dealt with humans. God promises, God does. He does it freely and completely in the life, death and resurrection of Jesus. And humans, unable, like we see in Abram, unable to deal with all of the obstacles in front of them at the deepest, the problem of sin in themselves, must trust him. And as humans take God at his word, trust him. He declares them to be right with him. How does God deal with humans? Well, he deals with them with his free mercy, with his unmerited kindness, with his complete love expressed in his words, his promises, which he fulfills. So how should humans deal with God? Ignore him, disregard him, rant at him as a neglectful dictator, turn to him and ask for what deeds they need to tick off, none of those. How should humans deal with God? Well, take him at his word. Trust that he will do exactly as he says and rely solely on his fulfilling actions through Jesus Christ to deal with your sin and the brokenness of the world. Here then is the guts of Christianity. God deals with humans with mercy that they do not deserve, doing all the work to deal with their sin, committing himself unwaveringly to his rebellious world, climaxing in the life, death and resurrection of the great descendant of Abram, Jesus Christ. Our deeds do nothing. Our actions create no obligation on God's part. All humans must do is trust what God has done for us. That's how God has always acted. And that's what we know. Let me pray. Dear God, thank you for your word. Thank you that you give us everything we need. You commit yourself in faithfulness to this broken world to roll back sin and bring your blessing through the family of Abraham. Father, thank you that this plan, this promise, reaches its climax in the life, death and resurrection of Jesus. Thank you that you shower us with your unmerited kindness to us. And thank you that we can trust you, that you have done exactly what you promised by dealing with all of our sins in Jesus Christ. Father, forgive us for when we think otherwise, act otherwise towards you. 
Father, establish our trust in you on this firm foundation of your word and promise fulfilled in Jesus Christ alone. Amen. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, there might be some questions. uh, There might be some feedback. Uh, Please fill out that box at the bottom of the page.